You're the top You're the Coliseum You're the top You're the Louvre Museum You're a melody from a symphony by Strauss You're an Ascot bonnet, a Shakespeare sonnet You're Mickey Mouse You're the Nile You're the Tower of Pisa You're the smile on the Mona Lisa I'm a worthless check, a total wreck, a flop But if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top Best of luck, love. Thank you, Daddy, for everything. <laughs> oh, thank you, Vicar. Very nice. I'm so happy, aren't you? Yes, of course. Of course I am. Ralph? Hmm? What's the matter? Nothing. Everything's perfectly all right. It's all over. I would have thought it was just beginning, Phyllis. I'm not sure you should call me Phyllis, should you? Well, it's your name, isn't it? I have no intention of calling your husband Mr. Bennett. I can assure you of that. Now, be careful. He's very fond of Pamela. And so am I. Be nice to her, won't you? Whatever gives you the idea, I won't be. Oh, quite a few things. Ah, they are Gorse. Oh, Ralph, please. As I was saying, it will have to be Harold and Ralph from now on, won't it? Indeed it will not. In my office, I'm Mr. Bennett, everybody on my staff, and that includes you. Well, on parade, off parade, as it were, just like the army, eh? Exactly. If you excuse me, I've just got to see the culinary arrangements. Ralph. Well, if he'd given me half a chance, I was going to thank him for buying Pamela the house. Oh, the least we could do. Can't have our daughter starting married life in some scruffy little combined room, can we? Just thank your lucky stars, Phyllis. You've never had to do that. I'm sorry, Ralph. I didn't mean it. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, don't be so thin skinned. So boring. Stimson was here, outside the church. Was what? I think he's quite mad. Ralph, that awful, plumly Bruce woman. Was she anything to you? Honestly. Come along, Ralph. It's about time you paid some attention to your wife. <laughs> a partnership? After two months? I thought you wanted Pamela to have a decent standard of living. I do. But that doesn't include handing over the running of my business to a petty blackmailer. Oh, those are harsh words, Harold. They're truthful words. And don't call me Harold! <laughs> then stop talking to me as if I'm some bloody grease monkey out of the workshop. Huh. I'd sooner make one of them a partner. And I say that with all sincerity. So you don't care what happens to your daughter, then? I look after Pamela. Don't you worry about oh, that. Oh, but I do worry, Harold. Then don't. You've got a good home. An adequate salary, which is a great deal more than you're worth. So let that suffice for the time being. I could, if I was upset enough by your attitude. My dear Harold, show your dear wife certain photographs and hotel bills. And do it. I care for my daughter, of course. Maybe she's in this marriage partly because of me. So do it. And be damned to you. All I was asking... No partnership! Never. And I think that when my daughter's child has a name, she'll be a damn sight better off without you. So any time you want to hand in your notice, it'll be most sympathetically received.
And Gorse, as far as I'm concerned, you are simply a poor relation. What do you call this? Well, it was a shepherd's pie. But you are an hour and a half later than you said you'd be, darling. Perhaps if Take I it know, away and bring me some bread and cheese or something. There's no whiskey left, I don't suppose. You, you drank the last of it yesterday, darling. Well, if you knew that, why didn't you buy some more? A gentleman only drinks beer when he's thirsty. Darling, I should say you'd had enough to drink already. I'll be the sole judge of that, darling. Oh, Ralph, eat something. No appetite, my love. I lost it somewhere down at bloody Bennett's Motors when your old fool of a father talked to me as if I were a greased monkey. Please, don't talk about him like that. He's helped us. Well, he did pay all your creditors. He means well, really. No, he doesn't. Darling, I know I got pregnant. My fault. But Daddy gave us this house and everything in it, the furniture, everything. We have to be grateful. Oh, no, we don't have to be grateful. You have to be grateful. He did it all for you. What's he ever done for me? Tell me that. As I just said, darling, he gave us this house. No, darling, he gave you the house. I don't see the difference. Well, I do. A man likes to feel master in his own house. And I don't feel like that. I feel like a lodger. Or as your dear daddy so charmingly put it, a poor relation. Well, I'm sure daddy never said that. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He did ask him. Ralph, I don't know what you want. I do everything I can for you. Considering this house is yours. It's yes. ours, darling. It's in your name. That's only daddy being... That's daddy being himself. A man should own his own house. Otherwise he gets no respect from anyone. I... I don't know if daddy would agree to my... Changing the house into your name. Well, then don't. Or do and don't tell him. What's it got to do with him? It's your house. Yes, but he gave it to me. Oh, well, don't bother. To hell with it. Darling, you know what Daddy's thinking? No, I don't know what Daddy's thinking. Well, he's thinking that it's him I'm talking about, not me. But he's thinking that since you got into such trouble with people, owing them all that money and everything, and not paying them back, all those dud checks and everything. Well, you have to see it from his point of view. He wonders if you've turned over a new leaf. Well, you do see that, don't you, Ralphie? Thank you. What? I can now see just how much you love me. Oh, but I do. Two things. One, never call me Ralphie again. I'm sorry, darling, I didn't know you didn't like it. And if you ever talk to me like that, ever again, I'll probably kill you. Clarice Manners. And it's you. Well, hello, stranger. How are you? Oh, do you really want to know? Why do you ask that? Oh, because I haven't heard from you for months. Well, you're hearing from me now. Obviously. Why? Well, I want to see you. Why else? I'm not sure. I want to see you, Ralph. Oh, yes, of course you do. How about tea at the Ritz, four o'clock on Sunday? Well, I'm supposed to be busy. All right, don't bother then. No, I, I can do it. I'll see you then. But I shouldn't. Oh, Ralph, so what's been going on? Are I've got to right? go now. Goodbye. What you doing in my office? I was just telephoning your daughter to say I was going to be late. I've got a prospect for the Morris. Oh, it's a place of business, not a domestic agency. 
Hope your prospect's a good one. If you were as good at selling motor cars as you are as putting girls in the club, we'd all be rich. Is that the Gorse residence? Is that Mrs. Pamela Gorse? Yes. Who is this, please? This will be a little bit of a surprise to you, Pamela, but I don't want you to be alarmed. This is Donald Stimson. Donald? Oh, I see. Yes? Do you remember me? How could I forget? Uh, do, you, do you want to speak to Ralph? He isn't here. No, I want to speak to you. To me? Why? Because I care what happens to you, Pamela. Are you all right? How do you mean all right? Well, it's three months now since the wedding, and uh, is Ralph behaving himself? I'm sorry, Mr. Stimson, but I don't know what you mean. I, I think you do. No, I don't. But then sooner or later you will, my dear. And now I'll say goodbye, but I want you to remember that I'm your friend. Now, if Ralph becomes a problem and you can't talk to anybody about it, your mother or your father, will you ring me? Reading 4073. You can talk to me. You can tell me anything. Reading 4073. Anything at all. sorts of reasons none of them good ones so you don't love her love her i hardly know her i haven't got a single bloody thing in common with her well, then why on earth did you do it oh circumstances people money i could have always found you some money ralph a hundred or so anyway it took a lot more than that darling let me get this straight you got into this marriage because of money ralph i'm speechless well i'm more than speechless i'm devastated and i've got to get out of it what, just go? Can you do that? But I think. I really do think. I'll have to. What does that mean exactly? Well, what I say, nothing more, nothing less. I've got to get out of it. I must. Well, I can see it being boring and all that, if you don't love her. Oh, no, it's not her fault. She's not that bad, in a way. It's just that she shouldn't be married to me, that's all. That sounds pretty final. The thing is, I've got to get some money before I leave her, for her and for me. How do you propose to get that? Some sort of business deal or something? That's all the marriage has ever been, a business deal. Oh, don't tell me about it, Ralph. You know where to find me when you want me. And whether you're free or not free isn't anything to do with us. Come and see me when you've sorted everything out, including the money. The money? Yes. Of course. Naturally. There's one rather complicating thing. There's been a lot of war talk, you know. If the Germans go into Poland, my father says it'll be war for sure. War. <laughs> yes, then we'll all have something to worry about, won't we? <laughs> I bought that land over by Marsh's farm to build a small engineering factory. Take what, for goodness sake? Small parts for aircraft. The war's coming, no matter what Mr. Chamberlain says. You don't usually tell me your business. Why now? If you put that thousand pounds you got back from Gorse into the project, you could almost certainly double it or treble it within two or three years. Are you asking me to gamble my money on there being a war? Uh, no, I'm asking you to uh, come in on the ground floor with me. Well, it's very good of you, but no thank you. I had all that with Rafe Gorton. My money is back in the bank, on deposit, and there it stays. Didn't stay there for him, did it? Well, maybe I've learned something since then. Yeah, maybe I have too. Maybe... I could put in a hundred pounds. No, thank you. I don't need your money. Snell and I are quite well enough for each to handle it. But I thought you might want to take my advice and come in on a genuinely good thing. But no. You know how all this talk of money upsets me, Donald. Then we won't talk about it anymore. Well, I must get home anyway. I've got an early start tomorrow. You coming? Very well. Where are you going 
doing that's so important, anyway? No, just business. Glad you telephoned. Well, I, I shouldn't have really. Ralph would be very upset if he knew. Well, we'll have to see if he doesn't know, won't we? Another cup, please. Well, first of all, how are you? Well, I'm all right. I mean, I'm healthy enough. But not happy? No, not really. Why is that, my dear? Oh, I don't know a lot of things. Thank you. Well, like what, for instance? You said you had something to tell me about Ralph. Ah, first you must tell me how he's been behaving. It may not be necessary for me to tell you anything. If he's treating you as a good husband should. Is he doing that? No, not exactly. In what way is he being difficult? You're very prejudiced against him, aren't you? No, no, no. I'm hoping you'll tell me that all's well. That all's wrong is a little tiff. A lover's quarrel. I can't talk to Daddy about it. Or to my mother. You can talk to me. We've been having a lot of rows. Ralph's been out a lot at night. All night, sometimes. He spends all our money drinking, gambling, I don't know. I, I found lipstick on his shirt. I, I think there's another woman. But worse even than that, he... he he, re he got very upset when I refused to put the house in our joint names. He kept on about it, so I did it. He really frightened me of that. We had a row. <laughs> yes? What did he say, Pamela? No, Mr. Stimson, the awful thing is, I felt at that moment that he meant it. <laughs> Have you finished? Yes, I'm not hungry. I'm sorry. It's very nice, though. Are you all right? How do you mean? It's just that you're being very nice to me, that's all. I'm not quite sure how, how to behave. It's been so long. I know, I know. I'm sorry. It's my fault. Now, I'll do these. You sit down. Oh. Well, all right, if you're sure. I do get a bit weary. Yes. Pamela, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. Yes? If anything happened to me, what would you do? Where would you go? Why? What could happen to you? Well, haven't you noticed? We look like getting into a war. Oh, that. You mean if you went away in the army or something like that? Well, yes. Something like that. Well... I don't know. I suppose I'll try and keep this place on. What if something happened to this place? Hmm? Well, how, how do you mean it? In a bombing raid or something? Well, it's possible. <laughs> They're even issuing gas masks for children. Anything's possible, I'd say. Well, I don't know. I suppose in a crisis I could always go and stay with my folks. I'd hate it, but I'd live through it somehow. But, Ralph, please don't talk about such awful things. Well, just as long as, as I know you'll be all right, that's all. Oh, I think it's wonderful of you to worry about us so much. Yes. Pamela, I've got to go up to London for a couple of days. I've got a good sales prospect up there. 
couple of days? Mm -hmm. I get so lonely all on my own in this place when you're away. Well, why don't you go to your parents? Just for the weekend. My prospect may say yes to half a dozen company cars. <laughs> I might even be able to impress dear Daddy with that. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't want you to be miserable all over the weekend. If you don't go to your folks, I won't follow it up. It may not happen anyway. Oh, no, Ralph, you must try for it. Daddy would be impressed. All right, all right. But not a word to your folks, because it may not work out. Promise? Promise. You know, Ralph, some people really do have the wrong idea about you. What people? Your father? Oh, well, yes, I suppose so. Yes, well, not a word to anyone. Captain Gorse, Miss Manners is expecting me. Are you a member, sir? Uh, no, I'm not, but I understand I've been signed in. Ah. Yes, so you are, sir. I'm Mr. Archibald, sir. That's Archibald who? Uh, Mr. Jonathan Archibald, oh, sir. Yes, of course, Archie. Through that door, sir. Thank you. Lovely, Archie. You were dreadfully unlucky, I thought. Oh, God, not really. They were too bloody good. <laughs> You're being too modest, darling, as usual. Naturally. What did you think of that spectacular fall? God, look at it. I say, uh, I, uh, I think somebody knows you or something. Or uh, am I wrong? No, no, uh, he's an old friend. I, I left a message for him to come on. Ralph, over here. Be nice to him, darling. He doesn't know many people. He's been abroad. I see. Ralph, <laughs> how lovely of you to come along. Ralph, this is Archie. Archie Ralph Gorse. Hello. Let me uh, give you a drink. Thank you. Here we are, old chap. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, hear you're a colonial. I'm sorry? You've been abroad, colonial service, was oh, it? Well, no, no, not exactly. Well, I'm sorry, I thought... Well, I for was... a bit, yes. Um, I'm in business now, I'm afraid. Well, somebody has to be, don't they? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, Mr. Chamberlain will soon have a government composed entirely of them, won't he? I hope so. They can't do much worse than all those old Etonians, can they? Absolutely not, no. Well, look, uh, I'm uh, all sweaty. If you'll excuse me, I'll uh, go and have a tub. See you later, old chap. What do you want to do now, Ralph? Get out of here. Did you enjoy your supper, darling? Scrumptious. I get so hungry. <laughs> well, that's only natural, darling. <laughs> well, it's so nice to be home. I didn't realise how much I missed it. Well, there's always room for you here, you know that. <laughs> Daddy, what a funny thing to say. I'm married to Ralph now. I have a home of my own. Why should I come back here? Exactly. Harold, please. You know what I mean? If things ever got difficult between you and Gorse, uh, Ralph... Harold! Uh, it has to be said. There's no need for the girl to stay a minute longer with Gorse if she's unhappy. She hasn't said anything about being unhappy. You're not unhappy, are you, darling? No. What makes you think I might be? Well, nothing. It's just your father worrying, as usual. No, it isn't. It's more than that. I understand from a person that might know that Ralph Gorse has threatened you. This person? Is it Mr Stimson? Oh, Carol, please, leave it. Indeed, I will not. It has to be said, and I'm going to say it. Stimson says you told him Gorse threatened to kill you. It was a row, that's all. Well, people say things they don't mean. Well, that's true. I've often said I could kill you, Harold. He's been in trouble before. Some scandal about a boy drowning. Well, you never said anything about that. That's what Stimson says. He's been investigating Gorse's background to the uh, dot. He was never in the army. His father was a clerk in an office and he won a scholarship to his public school. He was expelled after the drowning incident. Oh, is that all? A lot of nasty rumour put together by a man who hates Ralph Gorse. Oh, really, Harold, I despair. You can despair as much as you like. Pamela, you're not safe with Gorse. Daddy, I can't believe how much you hate Ralph. He can be so sweet and tender. 
I think you're simply awful to talk about him that way, and I won't listen to another word of it. No, I'm sorry, Mummy. I'm going home this minute. Perfectly sordid place. Why did we come in the back way? Haven't you booked me in or no. anything? No, I haven't. I'm not going to either. Why bring me here of all places? To show you life isn't all the hurling club. You hated it, didn't you, darling? One day I'll join on my own terms. You are silly. Why should anybody want to join? It's a boring place. Not to me. Well, I could ask Archie to put you up if you like. Now, one day maybe he'll think of it for himself. What have you told your new bride? Mm -hmm. Well, where does she think you are tonight? You must have said something. I told her I was visiting a friend with a chest condition. <laughs> you said that? Oh, really, Ralph, the poor girl. <laughs> oh, she's all right. I'll fix things for her when I leave. And when will that be? One day soon, and we'll be together. Just the two of us. <laughs> will we? And what will we live on? Actually, I'm just about to come into a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds? Oh, well, I suppose we could live on that. For a bit. For a bit? My God, that's a fortune. It's not really, but it'll do. Where should we go? Monte Carlo? Anywhere you like, just you say. <laughs> do you know, I really rather like this. This horrible, sleazy room. Anything could happen here. Yes, it could. But whatever it is, it's got to happen within the next hour. Because then, my darling, you're leaving the same way you came in. Do you know what you make me feel like bringing me here? A cheap tart. Oh. Hello, Mummy. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about all that, but I do think Daddy was most unfair. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going straight up to bed now. I'm, I'm awfully tired. Yes. Night, Mum. I can't think why you're getting rid of me like this, Ralph. Because I have an early meeting in the morning. The most important business meeting. Well, I don't believe that. I expect you'll tell me the truth sometime. There's one thing I do know. It won't be another woman. Can you find your own way out? Oh, darling, I've been walking out of strange hotels since I was 17. Goodbye, then. I'll see you soon. A couple of weeks. I'll have the money by then. <laughs> darling, you are Funny. I don't give a flying fig about the money. But I'll remember this place.
and to the unhappy young husband, Ralph. Most of you will have read the report of the coroner's court. His verdict of death by misadventure is a sad summary of a young life snuffed out. A poor, dear girl. But Pamela at least has been spared the great struggle which is now upon us all, and of which our Prime Minister, Mr Chamberlain, spoke so movingly on the wireless yesterday. We are now a nation at war. Let us pray it be God's will that all present will be spared, as our dear departed sister Pamela has not been spared. It's over, Donald. I mean, Rafe's widowed. He's lost his wife and his unborn child. I mean, then nothing else can happen to him. Even you must see that. Well, there's still a few ends to tie up. Donald, we may all be dead in a month. A week if those gas attacks start. Let's go home. If anything is going to happen to us, let it happen at home. I've told you my business here is not quite finished. Then mine is. Why I came here. I know why you did. You just wanted to see Rafe broken. Well, there you have. What that poor boy must be feeling at this moment. Nothing. What? That poor boy is feeling absolutely nothing. Oh, what a wicked thing to say. I know Rafe has behaved very badly. It's all right, all right, all right. He's deceived me. He's robbed you. And more. Well, I'm going to catch the next train. If you want to stay here, Donald, that is your business. Yes, it is, isn't it? And a pretty nasty business, I must say. <clears throat> I'll see you when I see you, Donald. you do now, Ralph? I have no idea. Haven't thought about it at all? No. I expect you'll go in the army, won't you? Well, most people. You were with a woman in that room, weren't you? Oh, does it matter? There's something fishy about all this. I wish I knew what it was. That lovely girl, gone. She hadn't met you, you young bastard. Oh, Harold, please, it's no good. The coroner was satisfied with Ralph's explanation. Well, 
He might have been. But by God, I'm not. I'm satisfied with nothing about this young man. Nothing! Oh, Harold, please stop talking like that. You can't bring Pamela back. I'm selling balance mothers. Taking what I can get and leaving this town. Well, that's the most sensible thing you've said today, Harold. So you'll be out of a job. At least I can do that. What I can't understand is why Pamela went back to the house. I thought she was staying with you over the weekend. Why did she go back? Very strange, that. I don't like uh, Ralph Gorse any more than you do, Mr. Simpson. I don't want any scandal either. See, I'm going to try and sell this business and move down to the West Country for the duration. Any breath of scandal might... Uh, harm the chance of a decent sale. Well, there's no scandal likely. But first, answer me a question, if you will. Who stands to get the insurance money? Well, Gorse does, of course. As her husband, or two thousand pounds of it. Oh. Well, my daughter was given uh, a lot of jewellery on her marriage by her mother's family. <clears throat> Before she... Um... Before the tragedy, your daughter told me that Gorse had forced her to put the house and contents in both names. Do you realise what you're saying? Mm -hmm. The insurance assessor will be here in a minute. Yeah, you'll wait. Especially in view of our joint statement. He'll be glad to wait. Joint statement? You insured the house and contents in your daughter's name only, correct? Gorse gets her to change that to both names within a few weeks. And now he gets everything. Do you want that to happen? No, I do not. That's what I thought. You're late, Mr. Sawyer. I'm thinking, Mr. Smith. Sir? What is our objective here? To pay out as little as possible, sir. Exactly. And I don't like this one at all. upstairs. Mr. Gorse, are you 
you told the coroner that on the night of the fire, you stayed at the Royal Commercial Hotel in Paddington? So I did. I produced the bill and the reception clerk gave written evidence that I stayed there. It was highly fortunate that he remembered you. If he'd been in any way indecisive about remembering you, I think you might have had trouble. Not from Mr. Smith and myself, but from another quarter. You say that I lit the fire, that I drove all the way from London and back to do it. I've not said that, Mr. Gorse. You've said it. But it is a most interesting hypothesis, Mr. Smith. Yes, it is. Mr. Smith and I see a lot of fires, and we hear a lot of people say things, both to the police and to coroners, and to our good selves, that either contradict each other, or are not well remembered, or sometimes, regrettably, are short of being the whole truth. Are you saying I told the coroner a pack of lies? Did I say that, Mr. Smith? I didn't say that. Not exactly. Then what did you say? Is it a fact that you and your wife had been in a state of domestic unhappiness for some time? No, it isn't. If you say so. That does not really concern us. It may concern others. It may even concern the police. How the fire started. Now, that concerns us a great deal, Mr. Gorse. I thought all that had been dealt with by the coroner. And the coroner returned a verdict of death by misadventure. We were surprised, were we not, Mr. Smith, that he did not ask for more detailed forensic evidence? We were very surprised. Mm. Of course, there's a war on now. Things are slacker, perhaps. What did you expect this um, further forensic work to find? Evidence of how the fire really started. Was it by accident? By your evidence, you've left newspapers adjacent to the stove from time to time. Mr. Gorse, how often do you think Mr. Smith and I have investigated a fire started from that particular make of stove? I have no idea. Hmm? Never, Mr. Gorse. Not from that particular make of stove. It's considered to be extremely safe. Mr. Gorse, you only recently became a joint beneficiary of this insurance policy, which covers the house and its contents. And now, since the unfortunate death of your wife, you are the sole beneficiary. So what do we have here, Mr. Smith? A changed policy and then a fire. Mm. A fire of a kind Mr. Smith and I have never seen before in which your wife dies. Were there any firelighters near the stove? Well, I have no idea. But there could have been. Well, perhaps. I do not tend the stove or light it, so I wouldn't know. Very well, let's leave that for just a moment and turn to a rather disturbing aspect of this case. I have, from an independent source, a sworn statement that you threatened to kill your wife less than a week ago. A sworn statement from whom? Oh, I regret I cannot tell you that. Only if it's entered as evidence in a court of law. That's the only way you can learn who the person is. I think I can guess. Information was also laid that you have a well, shall I say, less than impeccable history of money dealings. I refer to Mrs. Joan Plumley Bruce. Does that name mean anything to you? Go on. There's nothing more for me to say, except that Mr. Smith and I are not prepared to pay out to you, in full or in part, the sum insured, 1,994 pounds, 18 shillings and sixpence, without a very great deal more investigation of this fire, both from the forensic point of view and from, shall I say, the motivational point of view. In short, we're not satisfied, Mr. Gorse, not satisfied at all. Correct, Mr. Smith? Absolutely correct. Of course, you can sue us through the courts if you wish to do that. I will let you know what course of action I propose to take. Naturally. We will await your decision with interest. Good day, gentlemen. And to you, Mr. Gorse.
you're the top. You're Mahatma Gandhi, you're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy, you're the purple light of a summer night in Spain. You're the National Gallery, your garbo salary, your cellophane. You're sublime. You're a turkey dinner. You're the time of a Derby winner. I'm a toy balloon that's faded soon to pop. But if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. But if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. Upstairs. Mr. Gorse, you told the coroner that on the night of the fire you stayed at the Royal Commercial Hotel in Paddington. So I did. I produced the bill and the reception clerk gave written evidence that I stayed there. It was highly fortunate that he remembered you. If he'd been in any way indecisive about remembering you, I think you might have had trouble. Not from Mr. Smith and myself, but from another quarter. You say that I lit the fire, that I drove all the way from London and back to do it. I've not said that, Mr. Gorse. You've said it. But it is a most interesting hypothesis, Mr. Smith. Yes, it is. Mr. Smith and I see a lot of fires, and we hear a lot of people say things, both to the police and to coroners, and to our good selves, that either contradict each other, or are not well remembered, or sometimes, regrettably, are short of being the whole truth. Are you saying I told the coroner a pack of lies? Did I say that, Mr. Smith? I didn't say that. Not exactly. Then what did you say? Is it a fact that you and your wife had been in a state of domestic unhappiness for some time? No, it isn't. If you say so. That does not really concern us. It may concern others. It may even concern the police. How the fire started. Now, that concerns us a great deal, Mr. Gorse. I thought all that had been dealt with by the coroner. And the coroner returned a verdict of death by misadventure. We were surprised, were we not, Mr. Smith, that he did not ask for more detailed forensic evidence. We were very surprised. Mm. Of course, there's a war on now. Things are slacker, perhaps. What did you expect this um, further forensic work to find? Evidence of how the fire really started. Was it by accident? By your evidence, you left newspapers adjacent to the stove from time to time. Mr. Gorse, how often do you think Mr. Smith and I have investigated a fire started from that particular make of stove? I have no idea. Yeah. Never, Mr. Gorse. Not from that particular make of stove. It's considered to be extremely safe. Mr. Gorse, you only recently became a joint beneficiary of this insurance policy, which covers the house and its contents. And now, since the unfortunate the Royal Commercial Hotel in Paddington. So I did. I produced the bill and the reception clerk gave written evidence that I stayed there. It was highly fortunate that he remembered you. If he'd been in any way indecisive about remembering you, I think you might have had trouble. Not from Mr. Smith and myself, but from another quarter. You say that I lit the fire, that I drove all the way from London and back to do it. I've not said that, Mr. Gorse. You've said it. But it is a most interesting hypothesis, Mr. Smith. Yes, it is. Mr. Smith and I see a lot of fires, and we hear a lot of people say things, both to the police and to coroners, and to our good selves, 
that either contradict each other or are not well remembered or sometimes, regrettably, are short of being the whole truth. Are you saying I told the coroner a pack of lies? Did I say that, Mr. Smith? I didn't say that. Not exactly. Then what did you say? Is it a fact that you and your wife had been in a state of domestic unhappiness for some time? No, it isn't. If you say so. That does not really concern us. It may concern others. It may even concern the police. How the fire started. Now, that concerns us a great deal, Mr. Gorse. I thought all well, that had been dealt with by the coroner. And the coroner returned a verdict of death by misadventure. We were surprised, were we not, Mr. Smith, that he did not ask for more detailed forensic evidence. We were very surprised. Mm. Of course, there's a war on now. Things are slacker, perhaps. What did you expect this um, further forensic work to find? Evidence of how the fire really started. Was it by accident? By your evidence, you left newspapers adjacent to the stove from time to time. Mr. Gorse, how often do you think Mr. Smith and I have investigated a fire started from that particular make of stove? I have no idea. Yeah? Never, Mr. Gorse. Not from that particular make of stove. It's considered to be extremely safe. Mr. Gorse, you only recently became a joint beneficiary of this insurance policy, which covers the house and its contents. And now, since the unfortunate death of your wife, you are the sole beneficiary. So what do we have here, Mr. Smith? A changed policy and then a fire. Mm. A fire of a kind Mr. Smith and I have never seen before in which your wife dies. Were there any fire lighters near the stove? Well, I have no idea. But there could have been. Well, perhaps. I do not tend the stove or light it, so I wouldn't know. Very well, let's leave that for just a moment and turn to a rather disturbing aspect of this case. I have, from an independent source, a... <laughs>
around the Whitehead Road, sitting on the canvas on the top of the road. Howdy, 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 There's no whiskey left, I don't suppose. You, you drank the last of it yesterday, darling. Well, if you knew that, why didn't you buy some more? A gentleman only drinks beer when he's thirsty. Darling, I should say you'd had enough to drink already. I'll be the sole judge of that, darling. Oh, Ralph, eat something. No appetite, my love. I lost it somewhere down at Bloody Bennett's Motors when your old fool of a father talked to me as if I were a greased monkey. Please, don't talk about him like that. He's helped us. Well, he did pay all your creditors. He means well, really. No, he doesn't. Darling, I know I got pregnant. My fault. But Daddy gave us this house and everything in it, the furniture, everything. We have to be grateful. Oh, no, we don't have to be grateful. You have to be grateful. He did it all for you. What's he ever done for me? Tell me that. So I just said, darling, he gave us this house. No, darling, he gave you the house. I don't see the difference. Well, I do. A man likes to feel master in his own house. And I don't feel like that. I feel like a lodger. Or as your dear daddy so charmingly put it, a poor relation. Well, I'm sure daddy never said that. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He did ask him. I don't know what you want. I do everything I can for you. Considering this house is yours. It's yes. ours, darling. It's in your name. That's only Daddy being... That's Daddy being himself. A man should own his own house. Otherwise he gets no respect from anyone. I... I don't know if Daddy would agree to my changing the house into your name. Well, then don't. Or do and don't tell him. What's it got to do with him? It's your house. Yes, but he gave it to me. Oh, well, don't bother. To hell with it. Darling, you know what Daddy's thinking? No, I don't know what Daddy's thinking. Well, he's thinking that it's him I'm talking about, not me. But he's thinking that since you got into such trouble with people, owing them all that money and everything, and not paying them back, all those dud checks and everything, well, you have to see it from his point of view. He wonders if you've turned over a new leaf. Well, you do see that, don't you, Ralphie? Thank you. What? I can now see just how much you love me. Oh, but I do. To see you, Ralph. Oh, yes, of course you do. How about tea at the Ritz, four o'clock on Sunday? Well, I'm supposed to be busy. All right, don't bother then. No, I, I can do it. I'll see you then, but I shouldn't. Oh, Ralph, so what's been going on? Are I've got to right? go now. Goodbye. You did in my office. I was just telephoning your daughter to say I was going to be late. I've got a prospect for the Morris. Well, it's a place of business, not a domestic agency. Hope your prospect's a good one. If you were as good at selling motor cars as you are as putting girls in the club, we'd all be rich. Is that the Gorse residence? Is that Mrs. Pamela Gorse? Yes, who is this, please? This will be a little bit of a surprise to you, Pamela, but I don't want it to be alarmed. This is Donald Stimson. Donald? Oh, I see. Yes? Do you remember me? How could I forget? Uh, do, you, do you want to speak to Ralph? He isn't here. No, I want to speak to you. To me? Why? Because I care what happens to you, Pamela. Are you all right? How do you mean, all right? Well, it's three months now since the wedding, and... Uh, is Ralph behaving himself? I'm sorry, Mr. Stimson, but I don't know what you mean. I, I think you do. No, I don't. But then sooner or later you will, my dear. And now I'll say goodbye, but I want you to remember that I'm your friend. Now, if Ralph becomes a problem and you can't talk to anybody about it, your mother or your father, will you ring me? Reading 4073. You can talk to me. You can tell me anything. Reading 4073. Anything at all.
All sorts of reasons, none of them good ones. So you don't love her? Love her? I hardly know her. I haven't got a single bloody thing in common with her. Well, then why on earth did you do it? Oh, circumstances. People. Money. I could have always found you some money, Ralph. A hundred or so, anyway. It took a lot more than that, darling. Let me get this straight. You got into this marriage because of money? Ralph, I'm speechless. Well, I'm more than speechless. I'm devastated. And I've got to get out of it. What, just go? Can you do that? Well, I think, I really do think, I'll have to. What does that mean exactly? Well, what I say, nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> to the unhappy young husband, Ralph. Most of you will have read the report of the coroner's court. His verdict of death by misadventure is a sad summary of a young life snuffed out. A poor, dear girl. But Pamela at least has been spared the great struggle which is now upon us all, and of which our Prime Minister, Mr Chamberlain, spoke so movingly on the wireless yesterday. We are now a nation at war. Let us pray it be God's will that all present will be spared, as our dear departed sister Pamela has not been spared. It's over, Donald. I mean, Rafe's widowed. He's lost his wife and his unborn child. I mean, then nothing else can happen to him. Even you must see that. Well, there's still a few ends to tie up. Donald, we may all be dead in a month. A week if those gas attacks start. Let's go home. If anything is going to happen to us, let it happen at home. I've told you my business here is not quite finished. No, it isn't. If you say so. That does not really concern us. It may concern others. It may even concern the police. How the fire started. Now, that concerns us a great deal, Mr. Gorse. I thought all that had been dealt with by the coroner. And the coroner returned a verdict of death by misadventure. We were surprised, were we not, Mr. Smith, that he did not ask for more detailed forensic evidence. We were very surprised. Mm. Of course, there's a war on now. Things are slacker, perhaps. What did you expect this um, further forensic work to find? Evidence of how the fire really started. Was it by accident? By your evidence, you left newspapers adjacent to the stove from time to time. Mr. Gorse, how often do you think Mr. Smith and I have investigated a fire started from that particular make of stove? I have no idea. Yeah? Never, Mr. Gorse. Not from that particular make of stove. It's considered to be extremely safe. Mr. Goss, you only recently became a joint beneficiary of this insurance policy, which covers the house and its contents. And now, since the unfortunate death of your wife, you are the sole 
beneficiary. So what do we have here, Mr. Smith? A changed policy and then a fire. Mm. A fire of a kind Mr. Smith and I have never seen before in which your wife dies. Were there any firelighters near the stove? Well, I have no idea. But there could have been. Well, perhaps. I do not tend the stove or light it, so I wouldn't know. Very well, let's leave that for just a moment and turn to a rather disturbing aspect of this case. I have, from an independent source, a sworn statement that you threatened to kill your wife less than a week ago. A sworn statement from whom? Oh, I regret I cannot tell you that. Only if it's entered as evidence in a court of law. That's the only way you can learn who the person is. I think I can guess. Information was also laid that you have a, well, shall I say, less than impeccable history of money dealings. I refer to Mrs. Joan Plumley Bruce. Does that name mean anything to you? Go on. There's nothing more for me to say. Except that Mr. Smith and I are not prepared to pay out to you, in full or in part, the sum insured, £1,994, 18 shillings and sixpence, without a very great deal more investigation of this fire, both from the forensic point of view and from, shall I say, the motivational point of view. In short, we're not satisfied, Mr. Gorse, not satisfied at all. Too modest, darling, as usual. Naturally. What did you think of that spectacular fall? God, look at it. I say, uh, I, uh, I think somebody knows you or something. Or uh, am I wrong? No, no, uh, he's an old friend. I, I left a message for him to come on. Ralph, over here. Be nice to him, darling. He doesn't know many people. He's been abroad. I see. Ralph, how lovely of you to come along. Ralph, this is Archie. Archie Ralph Gorse. Hello. Let me uh, give you a drink. Thank you. Here we are, old chap. Thank you. <clears throat> I uh, hear you're a colonial. I'm sorry? You've been abroad, colonial service, was oh, it? Well, no, not exactly. Well, I'm sorry, I thought... Well, I for was... a bit, yes. Um, I'm in business now, I'm afraid. Well, somebody has to be, don't they? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, Mr Chamberlain will soon have a government composed entirely of them, won't he? I hope so. They can't do much worse than all those old Etonians, can they? Absolutely not, no. Well, look, uh, I'm uh, all sweaty. If you'll excuse me, I'll uh, go and have a tub. See you later, old chap. What do you want to do now, Ralph? Get out of here. Did you enjoy your supper, darling? Scrumptious. I get so hungry. <laughs> well, that's only natural, darling. <laughs> well, it's so nice to be home. I didn't realise how much I missed it. Well, there's always room for you here, you know that. <laughs> Daddy, what a funny thing to say. I'm married to Ralph now. I have a home of my own. Why should I come back here? Exactly. Harold, please. You know what I mean? If things ever got difficult between you and Gorse, uh, Ralph... Harold! Uh, it has to be said. There's no need for the girl to stay a minute longer with Gorse if she's unhappy. She hasn't said anything about being unhappy. You're not unhappy. Are you, darling? No. What makes you think I might be? Well, nothing. It's just your father worrying, as usual. Well, no, it isn't. It's more than that. I understand from a person that might know that Ralph Gorse has threatened you. This person? Is it Mr Stimson? Oh, Carol, please, leave it. Indeed, I will not. It has to be said and I'm going to say it. Stimson says you told him Gorse threatened to kill you. It was a row, that's all. Well, people say things they don't mean. Well, that's true. I've often said I could kill you, Harold. He's been in trouble before. Some scandal about a boy drowning. Well, you never said anything. Mr. Smith. Sir? What is our objective here? To pay out as little as possible, sir. Exactly. And I don't like this one at all.
Mr. Gold. Yes, sir. Mr. Bennett said to tell you to wait out here. He's got someone in with him. Really? As you wish. Two gentlemen are waiting for you upstairs. told the coroner that on the night of the fire you stayed at the Royal Commercial Hotel in Paddington. So I did. I produced the bill and the reception clerk gave written evidence that I stayed there. It was highly fortunate that he remembered you. If he'd been in any way indecisive about remembering you, I think you might have had trouble. Not from Mr. Smith and myself, but from another quarter. You say that I lit the fire, that I drove all the way from London and back to do it. I've not said that, Mr. Gorse. You've said it. But it is a most interesting hypothesis, Mr. Smith. Yes, it is. Mr. Smith and I see a lot of fires, and we hear a lot of people say things, both to the police and to coroners, and to our good selves, that either contradict each other, or are not well remembered, or sometimes, regrettably, are short of being the whole truth. Are you saying I told the coroner a pack of lies? Did I say that, Mr. Smith? I didn't say that. Not...
Morning, Millie. When my daughter's child has a name, she'll be a damn sight better off without you. So any time you want to hand in your notice, you'll be most sympathetically received. And Gorse, as far as I'm concerned, you are simply a poor relation. What do you call this? Well, it was a shepherd's pie. But you are an hour and a half later than you said you'd be, darling. Perhaps if Take I it away and bring me some bread and cheese or something. There's no whiskey left, I don't suppose. You, you drank the last of it yesterday, darling. Well, if you knew that, why didn't you buy some more? A gentleman only drinks beer when he's thirsty. Darling, I should say you'd had enough to drink already. I'll be the sole judge of that, darling. Oh, Ralph, eat something. No appetite, my love. I lost it somewhere down at Bloody Bennett's Motors when your old fool of a father talked to me as if I were a greased monkey. Please, don't talk about him like that. He's helped us. Well, he did pay all your creditors. He means well, really. No, he doesn't. Darling, I know I got pregnant. My fault. But Daddy gave us this house and everything in it, the furniture, everything. We have to be grateful. Oh, no, we don't have to be grateful. You have to be grateful. He did it all for you. What's he ever done for me? Tell me that. So I just said, darling, he gave us this house. No, darling, he gave you the house. I don't see the difference. Well, I do. A man likes to feel master in his own house. And I don't feel like that. I feel like a lodger. Or as your dear daddy so charmingly put it, a poor relation. Well, I'm sure daddy never said that. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He did ask him. Ralph, I don't know what you want. I do everything I can for you. Considering this house is yours. It's yes. ours, darling. It's in your name. That's only daddy being... That's daddy being himself. A man should own his own house. 